Hello, everybody. I'm grateful to the Heaven's Right Center for hosting uh, today's discussion panel. Uh, our panelists, Oksana Duchak, Anastasia Rupchuk, and Vasil Chiripanin, are the social and human scientists from Ukraine who will share their thoughts on the historical, cultural, and socioeconomic nature of the ongoing Russian invasion in Ukraine and um, policies and actions on the part of national and international actors, as well as leftist political forces uh, needed to put an end to the devastation that the Ukrainian people are facing. Uh, Oksana Dutchak is a PhD in social sciences, uh, the deputy director of the Center for Social and Labor Research uh, uh, based in Kyiv and the co-editor of the Journal for Social Critic uh, Commons. As a researcher, she focuses uh, on political protests, uh, workers' protests, uh, gender inequality, social reproduction, Marxism, and Marxist feminism. Vasil Chirpanin is the head of the Visual Culture Research Center, VCRC, an institution founded in Kyiv in 2008 as a platform for collaboration among academic, artistic, and activist communities. Uh, this institution is the organizer of Kyiv Biennale from uh, Biennale, Biennale uh, from 2015 to 2021 and uh, a founding member of the East Europe Biennial uh, Alliance. He holds a PhD in philosophy and has lectured at the Ukrainian National University of Kyiv Mohyla Academy and a bunch of European universities uh, uh, in, uh, in Finland, uh, Germany, uh, and others. Um, he has also been a visiting fellow, fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna in 2016. Anastasia Rybchuk is an associate professor in sociology at the Ukrainian National University of Kyiv Mohyla Academy, a researcher of labor, poverty, uh, and workers' movement in Ukraine and South Africa, and she is the co-founder of the Journal for Social Critic Commons, and Ukrainian publishing house Medusa. So each panelist shall speak for 15 minutes, uh, which will leave us approximately 45 minutes for uh, Q&A. And uh, Vasil, would you like to uh, start? Yeah, thanks so much, Anna. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's my great pleasure and honor to, uh, to be here among the uh, such an honorable speakers. Uh, and first of all, uh, let me express my uh, deep gratitude to the Heavens uh, Right Center for uh, hosting us today. They, that's, uh, I think, what is being perceived as a genuine uh, solidarity gesture under the uh, current circumstances. And um, also, I have to warn, since I am uh, currently in Ukraine, that uh, it uh, might uh, happen that uh, the uh, anti-raid siren uh, starts off. So in that case, uh, I, I would have to switch off myself for half a minute in order to go to the cellar, and then I, I would be back, I hope. And uh, first of all, uh, just to, yeah, it's my honor also to start this discussion, which I find uh, super important. Um, I have to say that uh, I am actually very privileged uh, that I'm able uh, to sit here and having a pretty good internet connection and light and running water, unlike uh, millions of my compatriots who are currently deprived of that. And it's basically only thanks to the Ukrainian military, which is keeping the front line in the east and in the south and also in the north of the country, countering the, uh, the Russian army. Mm. So uh, I wouldn't, we actually, we, or I don't know, me at, at least uh, being here, I wouldn't be here without, uh, without this uh, factor. As we basically also, I think it's also a kind of a symbolic uh, aspect uh, to this, uh, that we are entering the 100th day uh, tomorrow of this uh, full-scale invasion. So um, I think that uh, like from my side, in order to kick off this uh, debate, 
uh, I would like to make uh, several points um, uh, trying to place uh, this ongoing uh, all-out assault against Ukraine from the Russian Federation side into a kind of um, conceptual con context uh, involving some uh, polit very important political and ideological notions. So I think, uh, so I would rather like place uh, the, the current situation in a way in between uh, revolution and war, between those uh, important uh, concepts, uh, basically very much known uh, from Hannah Arendt's uh, writings, right? So I think we, uh, what we have, uh, the first aspect that I would like to mention is that what we have to keep in mind in order to properly uh, understand um, the current warfare, uh, because it actually started uh, eight years ago, but uh, the full scale uh, phase, uh, as we all know, uh, began on uh, on the 24th of February this uh, this year. So I think that uh, first of all to keep in mind uh, is basically the very nature of the current Kremlin's regime, which is uh, which is basically I. I would call it counter-revolutionary, because we can talk a lot uh, about various um, assumptions and a priori, but uh, in any case, the alpha and omega of the Putin's regime has been always um, the idea to prevent the very pre precedent of overthrowing the dictator by the people. And uh, this uh, approach uh, basically lies in the very core of the uh, current uh, Kremlin regime. And uh, that ex that's exactly why he has smashed any opposition at home. And uh, that this aspect also lies behind all his inv military invasions into other countries, be it uh, Ukraine, Kazakhstan this year, Belarus, or places like Syria, let's not forget also about that. And uh, that is exactly also the reason why he has been so much obsessed with Ukraine, because Ukraine as a country uh, is really a pretty unique, uh, um, has pretty unique experience, having uh, lived through uh, two successful revolutions in the 21st century which is totally unprecedented on a pan-European scale. Basically, the Maidan revolution in 2013 and 14 can be called the last uh, European revolution so far, I suppose. So this specter of Maidan, this specter of revolution has been haunting the, the Putin's regime for all these uh, years, basically, because uh, revolution as such uh, has been always the worst nightmares scenario uh, for him. And, and by the way, that's also the reason why uh, the current Kremlin regime has uh, many problems with the Soviet heritage, trying to claim this imperial past. Uh, it's not by occasion that uh, in his famous uh, Crimean speech, as well as in his uh, speech on the 23rd of uh, February, where he grounded the the occupation of uh, the Ukrainian territories, he actually accused uh, Lenin in uh, fabricating modern Ukraine. That's because actually he, has, he can take a lot from the Stalin's rule from the Soviet period, but he has problems with the Soviet Union in terms that uh, uh, we like it or not, but the Soviet Union uh, had a revolutionary start. Uh, so uh, the October Revolution, which uh, for Putin's discourse is a coup d'état, as he calls this, calls, calls it, uh, is also a problematic issue in, in that regard. So uh, in this sense, um, the current degraded form of the Kremlin regime is basically the result of, a, I would call it, a prevented revolution in Russia which uh, would have already happened there if uh, not the propaganda machine and unbelievable level of uh, repressions. So in this sense, uh, I would say that uh, 
Russia, of course, doesn't need uh, Crimea or any other Ukrainian territories. What it basically needs is a proper revolt because the basic uh, problem that uh, Putin's regime faces is actually the uh, absence of the mechanism of the transfer of power. So he is basically facing an impossible task, how to rule forever, right? <laughs> Which is just uh, impossible to conduct, of course. The second point I would like to make here uh, deals with the um, uh, Russian ideology, which is usually called uh, the Russian world or Ruski Mir, which is basically an ideology of a secondary origin because it, uh, it is functioning as a kind of um, distorting mirror image of the West, uh, trying to counter the what he perceives the Western ideology of uh, universal human rights. That's exactly why he claims uh, within the Russian world uh, framework, he claims uh, to protect uh, the, uh, the rights of uh, Russian speaking compatriots, so as, uh, as it's called. Uh, and uh, the main reason behind uh, this uh, uh, current Russian ideology is basically an attempt to present Russia as a um, sort of a anti-globalist traditionalist force, conservative force, which is able to preserve uh, some traditional values. Uh, in, in Russian, it's called skrepe, or maybe in English, it's braces, right? Uh, unlike uh, the decadent West, in which those values uh, have been effectively perhaps uh, evaporated. Uh, so that's a basic kind of Kremlin tactics, uh, mocking the West, right? Uh, through fabricating some illusionary past grandeur. And the, uh, and the only reason for doing that is basically to cover up the current uh, political and economic peripheral position of the Russian uh, Federation in, uh, in the world. So in this sense, I think that uh, it's perhaps one of the basic reasons why this full-scale invasion became possible. It's, uh, I think the key word here is of course, Afghanistan. Because uh, I think that uh, it's only after the crash of the um, West's idea of so-called uh, military humanism, which became famous after the uh, Kosovo 1999 military intervention, right? Uh, the, the idea to use force to further a humanitarian cause internationally, right? Uh, so this ultimate failure of this idea with the messy US withdrawal from Afghanistan last year and uh, Western retreat accompanied with the very speedy takeover of the country by Taliban. So the, uh, the Kremlin regime uh, sensed very well the consequences of, uh, of this because uh, it somehow refers to this idea which was once uh, expressed very well by Emmanuel Macron uh, as a NATO brain death, because it is exactly after this um, messy withdrawal, basically a catastrophic withdrawal from Afghanistan that left uh, the West uh, somehow conceptually disarmed because the notion of military humanism lost its ground in realpolitik and uh, the concept uh, was also sort of uh, broken into parts because uh, humanitarianism was divorced from military, from military, from militarism. And um, I think th that's very well uh, uh, sort of contributed to the idea to start and to conceive this uh, all, uh, all out assault uh, on, uh, on Ukraine. And actually a characteristic feature of the West after this uh, situation, uh, we, have, we have been actually in Ukraine um, experiencing this uh, basically since uh, the Russian invasion and occupation of Crimea and Eastern Donbass in 2014, right after the Maidan revolution. So it also came uh, as a kind of a counter revolution in a military form from the side of the Russian Federation. So this characteristic feature of the West uh, 
which basically allowed to all this happen, uh, to take place, uh, is constant belatedness. Because we clearly see today that uh, the West is basically in, uh, unable to, to act ahead. It can only react to what has already happened. So uh, the reason is that basically uh, the West has swallowed Russia's international crimes and uh, got along with this war for, for already eight years. And what we clearly saw already in 2014, and I think the uh, MH17 airplane crash hit by the uh, Russian book missile in 2014 was a very important case in this regard because, uh, we, because you know, Ukrainians have been always wondering what is this uh, famous uh, West's red line when the West is ready to intervene? And what we actually experienced that uh, uh, after this uh, airplane crash, uh, that uh, the West is ready to act only when the Western citizens are being killed. So when it's uh, about non-Western citizens, it's more or less fine. So because they are very deeply distur disturbed, but they are not uh, acting directly. So basically in 2014, only after the MH17 crash, uh, that it was after, only afterwards when the West uh, decided to impose sanctions on Russia. And the last thing I, I have to mention here, but not least, uh, is basically um, about the West's inability to recognize Russia's fascism, which I think a uh, stunning uh, case uh, nowadays. Let's not forget that uh, the Kremlin used the terminology of the so-called denazification and demilitarization and preventing genocide and stuff like that to absurdly justify its uh, invasion into Ukraine. Not by occasion, not accidentally. It's, uh, pe uh, it's perhaps the main ideological distortion of the Kremlin's regime is to repurpose the discourse, the vocabulary, the lexicon, which once referred to Nazism defeat in order to justify and to legitimize its own fascist military dictatorship. And uh, the problem is that basically the West uh, has been uh, domesticate, has domesticated the Russian, uh, the Western capital and Western politics has domesticated the Russian uh, fascist regime to the extent that it became uncomfortable for the West to publicly denounce it until it became too late. So um, after, to, uh, after February 24th, it <laughs> suddenly appeared that we got uh, an openly fascist leader who not only denies the Ukrainians' right to exist in his statements, but who also possesses an openly fascist propaganda machine, which uh, has issued even a special manifesto that proclaims uh, this genocidal purpose to completely exterminate Ukrainians as such. And who also has in his disposal an openly fascist state that is ready, especially in its military form, that is ready to execute this genocidal fantasy to completely exterminate Ukrainians because they shouldn't exist in his, in this leader's uh, mind. And uh, what is also important, I think that uh, uh, we can of course uh, refer here to the far right uh, in the West, which ha has been always uh, sponsored and supported by the Kremlin regime as we know. But it was not the far right, uh, but actually the West's liberal center and financial elites who normalized this uh, fascist leader. Because under the guise of liberal democracy, they have been pumping their assets into the Kremlin's mafia capitalism and got corrupted in reverse by it. So uh, I think that, uh, you know, claiming those uh, liberal values and admire them so much at home, they have, uh, uh, normalized the Russian ruler who turned all Russian politics into a special mob, uh, operation mode and authorized political assassinations, state censorship, 
electoral simulation, systematic repressions, and military invasions into other countries. So I, I'm here in a way on this uh, famous uh, Walter Benjamin's position that behind each fascism, there is a failed revolution. And we actually experience that in many, many cases. Let's not forget that we still live in this counter-revolutionary sequence, so to say, which started after the financial crisis in 2008. I mean, of course, this global wave of uh, different revolts and uprisings throughout the world in 2011 till now, uh, be it an Arab Spring, so-called, or Occupy Wall Street, or Indignados in Europe, or Ukrainian Maidan. So these famous square occupation movements, and what is really important to understand why uh, about the West inability to, to claim this fascism, Russian fascism openly, is basically because uh, this revolutionary wave remained unfulfilled. But it, uh, it wasn't just uh, that it didn't take place as such, that the West wasn't ready to appropriate all the revolutionary outcomes of this global wave of uh, square occupations, but it was substituted. So it not just that it didn't take place, but it didn't take place because something else did take place because it was substituted with uh, different forms of a counter revolution, including the warfare like in Ukraine, as well as like in Syria. But we also know other, place, uh, other consequences of that, that instead of uh, the results of Occupy Wall Street, we got Trump in the US. Instead of the German Wir schaffen das with regards to refugees, we got total anti-refugee consensus throughout Europe. So I think we have to learn from the revolutionary experience in order to approach uh, today's situation in a proper manner. I put comma here, thank you so much again. Thank you, Vasil. Um... Well, uh, we will we will now switch to Aksana Dubchak, and yes, and uh, questions will be later. <laughs> All right, Aksana, would you would you like to start? Um, yes, thank you. Uh, I think it will be a little bit hard after a good uh, speech by Vasil, but I will uh, try to reflect a bit more about other issues and in the end, hopefully coming back to the question of fascism, which is, uh, well, there are very hot debates about this um, issue now, uh, including like by Russian intellectuals, oppositional intellectuals. Um, I would rather speak about the issue of imperialism. Uh, I mean, uh, Ukraine and the many Russian neighboring countries um, rarely have uh, doubts about whether this imperialism exists or not, but um, which is obvious from recent development and even before there were a lot of people still who um, unsurprisingly or surprisingly on the left um, who deny either the uh, imperialist nature of Russian state and uh, some of them were able to do it until now, uh, until uh, at the beginning of this war. Um, not that many claim this also, obviously after the beginning of war. Another position is that, um, of course, Russian imperialism exists, but um, it's probably not worth paying too much attention to it in the face of the far bigger and um, like hegemonic Western imperialism. I will briefly, uh, touch upon these two points, um, mostly on the first one. Uh, so the no imperialism argument, um, it uh, became kind of visible that it's based on a very um, superficial economic analysis. So the main argument here goes that uh, Russia is not uh, that big economically as many other countries in the world. Uh, but um, so its economy is not that strong to, to uh, do the imperialist domination, at least before. Uh, but uh, this, what uh, this argument loses is that imperial domination has several dimensions and economic, um, economic dimension is only one of them. I here would refer to Michael 
drops in analysis um, and uh, at his stresses that uh, in classical Marxism, uh, imperialism has several dimensions and economic is one of them, but it also has political and military dimension. Um, and even from economic perspective, uh, Russian economy is far less um, dependent on uh, Western capital than many other countries. It, it is far less uh, indebted, so its level of foreign debt is far less than in many, many other countries. And it's um, itself, it's actively participate, have been actively participating in uh, uh, foreign investment and other ways of uh, foreign economic policy. And um, it, uh, as we can see from the demography of Russia and from uh, migration inside Russia and from neighboring countries, uh, it uses this um, um, post-colonial and neo-colonial uh, dependencies that have been created throughout history to increase the rates of exploitation of uh, migrant people who are living and coming to Russia, uh, some partially legally, partially illegally, uh, un undocumented, and they are um, allowed to increase the rates of profit inside the country. And um, in the terms of uh, political imperialism, as Vasily already mentioned, like the, the issue of, uh, well, the issue of Ukraine before uh, in 2014, the issue, the situation with Belarus and Kazakhstan and many many other cases when Russia were trying to politically influence uh, uh, neighboring countries, its elite and changes of elite and elite, elite dynamics. And of course, the most uh, probably interesting uh, and staggering dimension is a military dimension, because basically due to it, it's kind of really hard to understand how um, so many people or at least, yeah, quite a lot of people um, oversaw the uh, imperialist nature of Russian state, because in the context of uh, Chechen wars, uh, in the context of war in Georgia, intervention in, of, in Syria, which um, Vasil was also already mentioning, uh, and in the context of that Russia has uh, the second army in the world, it's kind of close to impossible to, uh, not to see the imperialist nature of uh, that country even before the beginning of the war. Uh, the argument about uh, that, um, okay, Russian imperialism exists, but it's kind of good imperialism because it's competing with uh, Western imperialism, or it's not that significant because it's not that strong for Western as Western imperialism is. Well, it's, um, uh, this um, argument can be, um, of course, um, criticized from many perspectives, but uh, to sum up it uh, briefly, it's a kind of what people call a social imperialist argument. So there is a good imperialist and uh, either it's China or is either it's Russia or some other country which we like more than we like the Western countries. And so we will uh, take the position of those countries. Of course, I'm a little bit oversimplifying this discussion, but um, yeah. I think the point is a bit clear here. Anyways, both this position, either no imperialism position or kind of good imperialist position, uh, they both lead to what we have seen through the recent months in, in the discussion of Western, uh, mostly Western left. Uh, they lead to inaction, passivity, or even like kind of critical support of Russian imperial war. Um, I will also briefly uh, mention the internal dynamic of Ukraine, which uh, kind of explain a bit um, um, how the situation developed or how it became into being. And uh, Vasil was discussing some issues related to political dynamic of Ukraine and so on. I will try to put it into the frame of uh, um, political economic analysis, I would say, or something like that. So um, I think the, what many people also do analyzing Ukraine, Russia, any post-Soviet um, post country is uh, to understand what have been happening here for the recent years is you have to look back into the uh, 90s, basically, and beginning of 2000s. Um, when the primitive accumulation of the collapse of the Soviet Union and um, uh, restoration or creation of capitalism took place. Um, while in Russia, the political power, they consolidated 
um, economic elites and build uh, like very strong and repressive state apparatus and it didn't happen overnight it was uh, like a long process of 30 years uh, so it led to a kind of um, state capitalist version of economy with a very strong monopoly capital uh, in ukraine there were such an attempts to do it but they failed uh, and to explain this, um, I think one of the fruitful uh, framework which can be used is uh, Karl Polanyi understanding of uh, a free market capitalist dynamic. So he's referring to this pendulum uh, of uh, which exists in society, which moves between the crisis of legitimacy and the crisis of profitability. So on the one hand, we have the falling rates of profit for uh, capitalist elite, which are trying to push uh, market deregulation. Uh, in the end, uh, it leads to crisis of legitimacy, where the uh, society in general don't see this market deregulation, like see this destructive force uh, of this market deregulation and try to push for uh, market market regulation uh, to avoid like the catastrophe. Um, and uh, in Ukrainian case, attempts to cons consolidate like economic assets by, by elites, by economic and political elites. Um, and in the context of in 2013, like there was a split of elite, like it has been in Ukrainian society since 90s. So we didn't have the consolidation of uh, political and economic elite. And this split was obvious in every election and every like previous mass uprising, like in 2004 and uh, 90, uh, 2001, when we had Ukraine without Kuchma and other protests. Uh, but it became even more obvious in 2013 when we had the crisis of profitability for part of elite because uh, there was this attempt of Yanukovych regime to consolidate economy in his hands and hands of his uh, oligarchs. Uh, so for other oligarchs who are not part of the elite, it was um, a crisis of profitability. Uh, and in that, in the context of stagnating trade balance, they didn't have the space to increase their profitability without competing with this other group of oligarchs who were in power. And on the other hand, there was a crisis of legitimacy, which was obvious, for example, from the um, protests uh, which were which have been happening before Maidan. Uh, a huge part of those protests were social economic protests, so protests targeting explicitly, uh, protesting explicitly against um, deregulation of market. Either it were workers' protests or protest uh, against like uh, for some social economic security or against some anti-social uh, reforms and so on. Anyway, they were growing and it looks like in the point of uh, when uh, Maidan started, like these two uh, crises, crisis of profitability for, for one part of oligarchat and crisis of legitimacy for broader society, they kind of collided into what happened. Um, and I think like it's it was it was quite obvious in 2013, but uh, it can be retrospectively kind of um, extended to the events previously in history of, in the modern history of Ukraine. And uh, um, one of the result of this um, split of elites or inability to consolidate elites, how it was done in Russia, uh, was this um, maneuvering in foreign policy and in geopolitics uh, between different geopolitical orientation. So when one part of oligarchat came into power, they were more kind of pro-Russian vector of development, another part came and they were more pro-European vector of development. So it also created this constant shift um, which was manifested uh, in elections, but it was also manifested in this popular unrest uh, happening uh, in different years. Uh, however, like it's now obvious that annexation of Crimea and Russian role in uh, the war in eastern Ukraine and especially invasion, uh, which happened into um, which is happening now uh, it's like uh, the end probably the end of this maneuvering between different um, geopolitical option uh, because the pro-russian option is not viable now um, and here i will go back to the um, 
to what Vasil was uh, telling about um, fascism in Russia, because it's really a hard discussion. And the thing is that when Polanyi was creating his framework of analysis or his theory, uh, the main interest for him was actually the um, emerging of fascism. So he was trying to explain how fascism emerged as a response. So he perceived it as a response to uh, this uh, market development and the threats markets a capitalist market put um, for the society um, and it came to my mind actually because this um, note was made by Ilya Budraikis like uh, Budraikis a Russian um, um, scientist uh, who recently suggested that um, if we want to speak about fascism in Russia um, we cannot avoid referring to explicitly those theories like Karl Polanyi's theory. Because to understand the fascist tendency in Russia, is, it's not about the, the understanding of fascism as a rebellion of the middle class or petty, petty bourgeois or something like that. It's more like about the um, regime which tries to discipline the society top down, like uh, subjugating its totally to political and economic control. So in this, uh, in this um, respect, we are speaking about fascism as a result of capitalist development, because it's a reaction of uh, some societies to the um, offense of the free market and the destructive forces it brings. Uh, so probably this um, fascism or proto-fascism regime, as some people claim, uh, which we see in Russia is a way it was built as a way to defend uh, Russian elites from both the crisis of legitimacy and crisis of profitability. So all this history of uh, repressing opposition, it's at the same time another side of the history of consolidating capital uh, under political control. And yeah, and uh, it leads to, to this uh, very um, consolidated proto-fascist or fascist regime. Uh, the main question is here how and why to defeat this kind of regime. Um, and at first, there were many people had, or at least some people had hopes for some popular unrest in Russia, uh, at least to a scale how it was in 2014 there, when there were big protests against war, at least in big cities. Uh, but uh, it didn't happen. Uh, and the difference is probably these years, which happened after 2014, and the explicit those processes of the Bolotna Square protest in Russia. Uh, so after all these events, the regime was cons consolidated to that extent with state propaganda, with repressive apparatus and everything that uh, un unfortunately it cannot be defeated uh, in a, through, un through popular unrest because it's basically not possible in Russia now. Um, and here is a question, of course, that um, like when Polanyi, at least uh, the optimistic um, conclusions which Polanyi came to was that, of course, like fascism can be perceived as a way to for society to um, deal with the free market expansion, but another way to deal it is, of course, is the socialism. Unfortunately, um, this is another set consequences of the situation we see now is a huge split in uh, left cycles, uh, in global left cycles. Um, and yeah, I mean, a lot of things have been said about that uh, until recently. But I think for me, like what I'm thinking now about, like uh, the biggest dilemma of the situation is that, um, and this side of the story is rarely paid attention to, at least in Ukraine, and I think, yeah, probably out of Ukraine too, uh, that we mostly hear now voices of Western leftists, we hear voices of Ukrainian leftists where, where, where they are given like the, the ground to speak. Um, and there are reasons for that, but what is often missing here are voices from other countries of the global south, like Ukraine as a country of the global south. 
partially. Uh, and these voices may be the hardest in this forthcoming and heavily needed discussion because uh, we are speaking mostly about countries which are being subjected to Western imperialism for decades and more with a very destructive consequences. And uh, people in these societies, unlike Western leftists, um, they have like a very material reasons to, to hate Western imperialism, like most of all. Uh, and so they have far less uh, implication to support like struggle against Russian imperialism. And it's kind of, uh, yeah, probably explainable and understandable, at least more than uh, in the case of many Western uh, leftist intellectuals. And while the position of these people have little short term influence on the current events in Ukraine, uh, this discussion may be the key and may be the biggest obstacle for rebuilding international solidarity, which is, um, yeah, which have been under such a big blow under their current situation. Yeah, I think I will stop here. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Oksana. Uh, uh, this is a great uh, presentation. Thanks a lot. And I, I really, I'm, I'm looking forward to the Q&A session. Uh, um, and now I want to invite uh, Anastasia to to speak. Anastasia. Okay, yes. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's a privilege for me to be here um, with you today, and I'm grateful for the Havens Right Center for inviting me. Um, in particular, um, there's a very personal um, attachment that I have to the legacy of Eric, Eric Allen Wright, who visited Ukraine um, uh, back in 2012, I think he visited our department. And at that time I was teaching a course in public sociology uh, and uh, we invited Eric Allen Wright to speak and present his project on real utopias. And uh, since that year when he spoke to our students and they were really inspired by that idea of looking for real utopia somewhere in, um, in our world, in our society. Uh, that was one of the assignments I was giving every year to, to my students is to look for some cases of real utopias, looking at the three uh, criteria that Eric Ollenwright proposed, the desirability, um, achievability, I'm, I'm actually forgetting them now in English. Um, uh, yeah, but uh, looking at at, uh, at these uh, um, at the utopias that can be uh, not only imagined but also achieved uh, in in practice, um, and uh, the students every year they've been looking for those cases. And this year I'm also teaching this course, uh, and um, I'm teaching it online. And many of the students are very dispersed. Some have left Ukraine, uh, some don't have homes anymore, uh, some are in occupied territories. How some of them have joined the territorial defense um, or Ukrainian army. Uh, so it's it's a very unique context to be to be a teacher um, uh, in, and, and a student um, in Ukraine now. Uh, and uh, this course now uh, began uh, and the students received the assignment. And I was actually um, a bit worried, like, how are they going to be looking for those cases of real utopias um, in the context of war and whether they're going to find this uh, exercise relevant, uh, where they will want maybe to change the, the assignment, uh, considering the kind of the more gloomy um, context um, that we're in. Uh, and they, they actually were, were enthusiastic and they wanted to, to, to keep um, uh, that assignment. Uh, and uh, they immediately were coming up with different ideas ranging from the volunteer movement and the self-organization of Ukrainians to um, help um, uh, the wounded, uh, for example, or uh, civilians uh, who are evacuating or um, uh, or the projects, uh, some visions for rebuilding cities and the different manifestos that are written, for example, about um, affordable housing and how the state needs to um, regulate that uh, that market and how we, we can be kind of contributing to a kind of a, a vision of a more just society. And I was uh, I was a bit surprised that they that they well, uh, some of them at least were quite optimistic and were looking um, into the future where well, many of them were confident that you know we have to win and we will win and we have to start thinking already what the society will be like and how can we make sure that um, it's moving in the right direction. Um, and uh, and one thing that I, I think 
is important is this acknowledgement of agency. So I want to basically probably structure my um, talk as uh, Vasil and uh, Oksana uh, already mentioned many uh, super relevant points. Um, uh, so I, I will maybe um, talk about something different. Uh, and that's the, the agency of Ukrainians um, in, in this uh, context. Um, and uh, especially for the second question, what is to be done and what the left can do in particular to, to help Ukraine, I would say the main thing would be to acknowledge uh, uh, Ukrainians' agency uh, in, in this war. Because there's a lot of talk about geopolitics, about the interests of different um, big uh, powers. Um, and often it seems like Ukrainians are just kind of like puppets in some kind of a proxy war where there's interests of Russia, interests of the US, of, of the West. Um, and uh, uh, and we are just being used to, for some purposes uh, that we don't even understand or that we don't know. Um, and somehow we don't have the right to ask for uh, arms to defend ourselves because that will, as some experts in the West believe, uh, uh, will prolong the war and prolong the suffering and um, and so on. So we don't. Uh, so 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 we in this picture um, that is often presented by Western experts, in particular, um, there's there's very little um, agency. Um, that Ukrainians have, and um, it's uh, I, I will speak mostly from my experience uh, as the editor of uh, Commons, a Spilne journal, um, where I, I was invited uh, on several occasions to different meetings by Western leftists. So I want to kind of engage in, in those debates, and I also want to re I will refer to the last question that Oksana uh, uh, posed uh, about the global South. Uh, because I myself, I studied uh, in South Africa. I did a postdoc there for five years, and I uh, and I also I agree with Oksana that it is a really one of the questions that is not um, discussed enough uh, in. Um, uh, uh, when we're talking about um, the Russian war in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, actually this, this question about agency could be one of the, um, one of the points of entry for a debate and a, a language that can also be um, understood by um, people, for example, in Africa or Latin America, who, who are also used to unfortunately being talked about by some experts uh, elsewhere who know better. Um, yeah, so, Virtually all of the social movements and organizations of the progressive left have condemned Russia's full-scale invasion that was launched on February 24. And uh, if we read it or look at all these manifestos that were produced, uh, they all call for immediate withdrawal of Russian troops. Uh, but although this point is fairly clear, many on the left have very limited understanding of Russian imperialism. And I'm very happy that both uh, Vasil and Oksana uh, focused on, on Russia and talked so much about Russia. But this is not the case uh, in many Western discussions, in particular on the left. Uh, and it's, of course, understandable that for all of us, our own geography, history, and specific sociopolitical constellation of our societies will impact our perception of global events. So, of course, if you're in the USA or in Western Europe, you will know much more about uh, your own society and uh, about American imperialism, say, than about Russian imperialism. Uh, but um, in such situations where um, you know you don't know en enough about all these other imperialisms and uh, in it, about Russian imperialism in particular, um, it makes sense to ask those concerned about their experiences and to try to understand their perspective instead of engaging in some kind of narcissistic exercise of manifesto writing that is actually often more about affirming one's own identity and repeating some cliche statements um, almost as a religious creed, like NATO is evil <laughs> and therefore the enemy of my enemy is, uh, is my friend or something like that. So, um, uh, often, uh, like uh, we were invited uh, as a commons to some uh, Western leftist meetings and they proposed some sort of manifesto and we didn't agree with some of the points. And then they ended up producing manifestos that didn't have any single Ukrainian signatory. So instead of uh, kind of asking us, why is it that we disagree with that point, trying to understand our logic, they would just produce their, their own manifestos. And of course, uh, we cannot trust such manifestos that don't have a single Ukrainian signatory, just like no African should trust 
the development projects or action plans that are written by Western intellectuals without a single voice from the African continent, right? So um, the Ukrainians are political agents and our views need to be taken into account, especially by those uh, on the left who claim people's right to self-determination and who claim to offer solidarity with the oppressed. So, um, uh, of course, uh, uh, there, the, there, there are people who prefer to surrender and there are countries who, um, of course, uh, who, who might say, you know, we are too weak to, to oppose a bigger, um, a much bigger power. Um, and so, I mean, some, some countries might surrender, but uh, uh, we, we also have, or to avoid more uh, deaths, um, like the French Vichy government, for example, surrendered to the Nazis in the Second World War. But it is the resistance and not the Vichy who are viewed as heroes by the left. So also this argument that you should surrender to, to avoid more death is, is kind of strange coming coming from the left that actually glorify resistance. And also um, in, in one article by Slavoj Žižek, uh, that many of you have probably read, where he says that this should have been good news that a smaller, a much smaller country um, is actually able to resist uh, a much bigger uh, enemy. Shouldn't it be considered like the, the good news for the left and, and for all of us? And that's actually part of a, of a story that's very familiar to us and that we all like from childhood of David defeating Goliath and, and so on. But uh, many people are actually scared uh, when, they, when they see this um, in reality, um, that, uh, that it would have been easier to kind of pity uh, victims uh, and just say, oh, we're so sorry, uh, to express our deep concern, to grieve the losses, and then to return to business um, uh, as usual. Um, yeah, and uh, making those links with the global south, we can say that, you know, our um, comrades in, in Africa, in Latin America and, and Southeast Asia, unfortunately, are too familiar with these situations of being talked about by foreign experts where you're seen at best as victims uh, who should be pitied and offered humanitarian aid, and at worst as corrupt, corrupt and incompetent savages who cannot be trusted with such delicate matters as political um, agency. Um, yeah, so um, as, as Oksana and Vasil said, uh, and, and I agree that um, an, another thing of what can be done and what can the left do is actually acknowledge Russian imperialism and try to look at it more seriously. And this is a, a big mistake of uh, much of the analysis uh, is that it was uh, ignoring or kind of uh, um, not paying enough attention to, to Russian imperialism and just acknowledging that there are more than one imperialist powers in the world. And um, uh, just because Putin's regime is uh, critical of the West, uh, as Vasily said, doesn't mean that it is better than the West or that it should be supported. Um, and uh, this regime deserves opposition, first and foremost, by those who suffer from it directly. Um, and Putin is not clearly not willing to tolerate an independent um, Ukraine. And the vast majority of Ukrainians do not want to be assimilated into Putin's vision of the Russian world. Uh, and actually, um, there was a, a joint statement of the Ukrainian and Russian left against Russian imperialism um, that um, I can share the link later. It was published on Left East, and um, I invite you to read it. Uh, and it actually, um, this was one, one point where the Ukrainian and the Russian left were actually in consensus of paying attention to the uh, Russian imperial to Russian imperialism and opposing it. And I can give a, a, one of the quotes is, uh, the left must show consistency and say no to all imperialist aggression in the world. Today, the imperialist aggressor is Russia, not NATO. And if Russia is not stopped in Ukraine, it will definitely continue its aggression. Furthermore, we must have no illusions about Putin's regime. It offers no alternative to Western capitalism. It is an authoritarian oligarchic capitalism. The level of inequality in Russia has risen significantly in the last 20 years of his leadership. Putin is not only an enemy of the working class, but also an enemy to all forms of democracy. Popular participation in politics and voluntary associations is treated with suspicion in Russia. Putin is essentially an anti-communist and an enemy to everything the left fought for in the 20th century and is fighting for in the 21st. In his worldview, the strong have the right to beat the weak, the, re the rich have the right to exploit the poor, and the strong men in power have the right to 
make decisions on behalf of their disempowered uh, population. Uh, and then there's also a list of demands uh, in, in this statement. Um, and it's interesting that many of those demands, um, and I will refer again to Oksana's uh, question about the global south, many of those demands um, can be seen as like a step to kind of starting a discussion um, about uh, uh, the global social order and changing some things. Uh, and many of the demands will benefit also in the long run uh, countries of the global south. For example, the question of canceling uh, Ukraine's uh, foreign debt, uh, Ukraine is still paying um, has to pay uh, uh, the debt to various international organizations that have lent it money and continue to lend it money. Uh, and that takes up a large percentage of Ukrainians' uh, budget, uh, just servicing the debt. Uh, and uh, this uh, demand uh, is, of course, very urgent for Ukraine, but uh, it is also a demand that we have uh, heard uh, back in 2000 for the Jubilee year to drop the debt of the poorest uh, countries um, in the world. And uh, it can be relevant for, for many other countries um, in uh, who are um, suffering from war and from from economic collapse, um, or um, the question, the demand uh, uh, on the Russian Navy to unblock Ukrainian seaports to secure grain exports, uh, because of Russian invasion, millions of uh, people in the global south are likely to suffer from hunger, and Russia must be held accountable for such immense human suffering, um, and. Um, other demands like a demand uh, for support to all refugees in Europe, uh, wherever they come from and whatever their skin color. So some people in Europe uh, now start talking about Ukrainians as kind of VIP refugees, but it's not the, the fault of Ukrainians that they are treated uh, better. It's it's a problem in 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 European societies that they they have this uh, racism in treating refugees. And of course, all refugees deserve the 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 same uh, level of treatment that Ukrainian refugees are getting and even better. Um. Yeah, and uh, the demand is of support for key frontline workers in Ukraine um, um, and elsewhere in the world, actually, who carry the burden of social um, infrastructure and needs of the civilian population during the war. And this is the time when we realize what a precious public asset a functional railway network is or public hospitals in such a fragile circumstances. Um, if we remember back in the 1990s, there was all this talk of uh, neoliberal transformations of post-communist societies where everything that was run by the state was considered dysfunctional and inefficient and we were supposed to privatize everything. And now we're looking back, we're saying, oh, how good that we haven't privatized the railway network. Thanks to, to this, uh, because all the private uh, transport for providers, they just disappeared when the war began, whereas the railway uh, network continued to transport uh, millions of refugees from war-torn parts of the country to safer parts and uh, to neighboring countries as well. Uh, so the railway workers are the real uh, heroes today, and same with the uh, hospitals and, uh, and uh, healthcare uh, workers. Uh, so uh, just uh, using that case, uh, the, of, uh, the Ukrainian case, uh, we can use it as an argument for other countries as well and say, you know, these are, are important public assets and we really need to defend them. Uh, and also a rethinking of how natural resources are exploited in Russia and elsewhere around the world by a minority of oligarchs and used as a blackmailing tool in geopolitics, um, right? So the fact that you have oil makes or, and gas uh, uh, shouldn't mean that you can just blackmail other countries and, and do what you want. And the need for demilitarization of the world, beginning with the simultaneous giving up of nuclear weapons by all countries that uh, possess them. Uh, so we can't uh, demand uh, um, of one country to give up uh, its weapons if we know that others don't plan to do it. And this uh, whole talk about the Budapest um, memorandum that ended up being um, kind of useless that you, when Ukraine gave up its uh, nuclear weapons in exchange for some uh, security guarantees, uh, it also brings the question of rethinking the global security order. And uh, why is it that uh, the United Nations can't really do anything? And why is it that we don't have any agents who are uh, actually able to guarantee um, uh, security and territorial integrity to countries countries that uh, suffer from um, aggression. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, there's also this big uh, debate uh, uh, that I already mentioned about Ukraine being used um, as a proxy and uh, NATO using uh, Ukraine um, as a proxy. Uh, and um, 
I also heard it uh, in when when I was giving a speech um, in uh, in South Africa. Uh, and uh, the first thing I answered back then when they asked me this question, is NATO using Ukraine as a proxy? Uh, what I answered to them is that <laughs> the answer to this does question doesn't really change anything of what I said above. Even if we say yes to this question, we should still condemn Russia's invasion and support Ukrainian resistance, including militarily. Uh, and uh, I, um, I mentioned back then the um, statement by Judith Butler, who is one of the kind of uh, most anti-militarist and anti-NATO leftist intellectuals who said, if NATO assists Ukraine, then they are doing the right thing this time. Uh, and she says, but that is no reason to become a fan of NATO. One is not for NATO, but for Ukrainian right of self-determination. One can want this war to end with Ukrainian popular sovereignty restored, but that is no reason to allow one's desires and thoughts to be constrained by a war logic or to think that only the two sides are the only actors in the scene. In other words, one can maintain a well-grounded skepticism of NATO and a general anti-war position and still maintain a profound wish to see the Ukrainian resistance prevail. Um, of course, the Ukrainians must fight for their country, the rights of self-determination, and, uh, and if and when this war ends, they will have to demand return and reparation like the Palestinians have been doing for over 70 years. That's a quote from Butler. Of course, Judith Butler is, has a privilege not to allow one's desires and thoughts to be constrained by a war logic in peaceful Berkeley, California, that is in part peaceful thanks to NATO, <laughs> uh, but many smaller and weaker states around the world don't have this privilege to think theoretically about NATO just in the abstract um, because war uh, is their daily reality and they have to deal with it. And to Butler's credit, she is well aware that in some cases NATO may be the only player with enough resources uh, to help their resistance. Uh, and yeah, so no matter how we answer that proxy question, Ukrainians still have a right to resist um, Russian aggression and accept uh, all the aid that comes uh, their way. And a comparison that I made uh, to the African context, I, uh, I said that this African reliance on Soviet support in national liberation struggles uh, on the continent in the second half of the 20th century. And it is, of course, under undeniable that the Soviet Union's support for African liberation movements was motivated first and foremost by its own pragmatic interests in the Cold War. And we might say that these uh, wars were also proxy wars. But does that mean that Africans should not have resisted or that they should not have accepted Soviet support? Right. So um, and that that would be kind of a parallel that um, um, that uh, I could give. Uh, and uh, of course, we have to be aware that NATO countries have pumped Russia with uh, at least uh, what 346 million euro worth of military equipment between 2015 and 2021, when, despite an embargo on weapons sales imposed on Russia after annexation of Crimea. Uh, so um, Germany and France uh, are NATO countries, and they're very hesitant to to actually um, offer military support to Ukraine. Uh, but they were the kind of the top donors of. Uh, uh, weapons to Russia in the time when they actually should not have been selling anything to Russia because there was an embargo. Uh, so much of so, so some of the military equipment that Russia is using now to to kill Ukrainians it comes from from NATO countries. Um, yeah, um, and uh, what else can I say? Uh, <laughs> um, Yes, yeah, so my answer was basically and then was that uh, criticism of NATO and of Western imperialism more broadly should not distract us from supporting Ukrainian resistance. Uh, and uh, there was a, a nice statement of intellectuals from the global south. Uh, it was published in Le Monde um, in, in French and was said in, I think it was in several languages. Um, so there were people like Arundhati Roy, uh, Paula Shoinka. Interestingly, I think uh, there was some, something like 79 intellectuals from the global south and Noam Chomsky. <laughs> it was it was funny to, to see him there. Um, uh, yeah, but uh, the the statement, it's a very short statement, um, and it's a statement that actually says that um, uh, we uh, we should not think that, um, because it's not uh, the, 
Western imperialism, then we shouldn't do anything. That uh, uh, if we um, or that we are in the global south, it doesn't concern us. And I can, if I still have time, I can read this short statement. It will be just a nice ending to uh, to my presentation. Uh, so here it goes. Since February 24th, Vladimir Putin has been waging a war of conquest against Ukraine. His army has been bombing and destroying cities, killing civilians by the thousands, as it did in Chechnya and Syria. The Ukrainians are resisting. We must support them without thinking twice or holding back. In most of our countries, however, too many people have sided with the Russian dictator. In the name of an anti-imperialism that has turned into passionate hatred over the years, they're applauding anyone who is opposing the West. The measure uh, We measure the... Uh, we measure the overwhelming responsibility of Western powers, large and small, for the devastation of our world. We have denounced the wars they have waged to ensure their continued dominance over the vast regions, including our own, and condemned their defense of indefensible dictatorships to protect their interests. We know their selective use of the values they claim, letting refugees from the South die at their doors and welcoming their own with open arms. But let's not get into the wrong battle. All those who demand freedom for themselves, who believe in the right of citizens to choose their leaders and to refuse tyranny, must stand with the Ukrainians today. Freedom must be defended everywhere. For our part, we refuse to support any dictatorship on the pretext that its opponents are our enemies. By defending Putin's war, we are depriving ourselves of our own right to be free. So um, I will end uh, with this quote, and maybe it will be an also a point uh, for discussion, uh, answering Oksana's question also about the Global South. I think it's a very important discussion. Um, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Anastasia. Um, well, uh, I hope you can turn your video back on. And oh. <laughs> uh, and uh, do you, you don't see me or what's um, happening? I think your video was um, like it froze for a while and now is it's it better now. Uh, can you like turn it off and then turn it on back? Okay, I'll try. Um, okay, I'm waving. Uh, it's, okay, if it's frozen, I can also try to disconnect and reconnect again. I think it's fine, Anastasia. Yeah, we yeah, can hear. The, the most important thing is that we can hear your wonderful uh, commentary. So, if uh, <laughs> Anya, if you would like to continue, and Anastasia, maybe your video will come back in. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll probably just reconnect again. Uh, I think uh, it will be easier. Yeah. Okay. So thanks again to all our presenters for their wonderful and insightful and informative speeches. Um, uh, I think we can switch to the Q&A section right now. Uh, I can, so I'll take the questions in groups of three and you can either ask a question uh, raising your hand virtually uh, or you can post them in the chat and I will read them for you. Um, and I think we already have one question. Um, I also have a question, so I'll, I'll probably ask a question. And okay, and Adrian has questions. So, so these are gonna be our first three questions. <clears throat> Oksana P asks, uh, I have a question to all speakers, but also more to Oksana and Anastasia. To what extent do you think anti-gender politics were and are used uh, by Putin to consolidate his regime and to build alliances with other conservative governments? Is crackdown on gender a consequence of or one of the foundational pillars of Putin fascism? Thank you. Oh, oh. sorry. And uh let's let's uh adrian go next and sure. then uh, thanks so much uh to our panelists i have a question about um uh the current ukrainian state and i'm wondering um about how you all are thinking of the ways in which uh the war is going to either speed up or impede the restructuring of the state given uh the eu's framing of its um 
uh, financial support. So suggesting that it, it basically, I felt as though it was asking you all to be open for business. And so I would like to know from you, especially um, regarding uh, topics or, or the, the comments that you made about the ways in which um, the private sector or um, capital is interested in um, restructuring uh, the way in which uh, Ukrainian state exists. Thanks. Uh, thank you. And my question would be about um, uh, about such things as imperialism, as we, we've been talking about imperialism here and uh, Polanyi's double movement. Uh, and the Lenin's notion of imperialism, which is like political, economic, and military uh, uh, actions on the part of the state. Uh, and I was wondering, how do you like combine these two uh, things as like uh, fascism, right, as an answer to the like market, uh, to, to the free, like to the free market, basically forces in the times of Polanyi. And uh, and and imperialism in the Russian case, and are these uh, so? If we take Russian imperialism and American one, can we can we actually talk about two similar imperialisms, or are they different? Because it seems to me that um, in the Russian case, it's it's a little more complicated due to like. Uh, historical economic you know reasons so i was i was just curious uh about your opinions on that we can go right um yeah thank you for questions i will go one by one i will go briefly so first oksana's question about the um, uh, anti-gender ideology of Russian regime and whether it's a basis or yeah or it's the consequences of its um, way I think like that um, it's really hard to distinguish what uh, what is there for that but uh, I think what Vasil was also telling about like that the conservative and this kind of traditional um, core or like main idea of um, uh, Russian society in recent decades. Uh, it's uh, very related to the idea of uh, conservative conservatism and traditionism in terms of anti-gender ideology. Uh, of course, I would say that in Russia, they kind of took it to a very um, extreme in terms of like uh, those laws about um, the criminalization of uh, domestic violence and so on. Uh, but we see like signs of that, like in many places of the world. Uh, the, um, yeah, so anyway, like we can say that conservatism is kind of very traditional, like uh, traditional conservative roles, uh, or gender roles, they're usually uh, um, present in uh, fascist or proto-fascist regimes. Um, but I, I think in Russian case, we are also are speaking not only about like the traditional uh, gender roles, we are speaking about kind of trying to reverse like this liberal um, agenda of uh, combating of protecting women from uh, domestic violence. So we can see uh, like this sign or the trace of this anti-liberal tendencies, um, uh, which influences the um, situation. But I think it's really hard to say whether it's like, it's it looks organic now and for, for, for many years and these tendencies were looking kind of, they were didn't come from out of nowhere. Uh, and they are also rooted in a very religious tendency in the society, but um, yeah. Uh, anyway, they they kind of uh, brought it to a new level, like trying to reverse the liberal um, pillars of like yeah, gender equality or protection from violence. Um, as for rebuilding um, or reconstruction of the state, well, the Ukrainian state have been a uh, neoliberal one for quite a while, especially from uh, starting from, I mean, it was before also, but starting from 2014, like when, yeah, like 
includingly advised by foreign advisors, but also because of the organic like beliefs uh, how the society should work when the like the crisis economic crisis um, uh, imposed by the war in 2014 and by the political changes uh, um, was they were trying to deal with this crisis like with a classical austerity anti-crisis policy so i don't think that um, there should be i mean it's kind of ukrainian state and ukrainian elites are on in on that track for years so it doesn't uh, take much to push them further in that direction and for the signs we see now are really worrying like uh, for example trying to to uh, to decrease the labor rights, the labor protection, it's like very, very visible now, like to, to do it during the war, what they have been trying to do since 13 years ago or 14 years ago, unsuccessfully. So they kind of use the uh, yeah, war to do it now. Uh, and the last question from Anya about the how the fascism the answer to fascist uh, to free market forces well basically because it's it is seen as an alternative regime which can to an extent control free market to not to expand it like it to to influence its society in the whole but it doesn't mean that it prevents from us free markets it just tried to control it and it basically as a kind of defensive force for defensive construction for elites because fascism presupposes like strong political repressive apparatus and it kind of protects elites from the crisis of legitimacy which leads to popular unrest mm -hmm. and it protects them from this side but it also protects them from the um, crisis of profitability because it consolidates economic uh, assets uh, in the Russian case, which is very obvious in the hands of the state or political oligarch hut, which is close to the, so it's kind of a structure which, which at least for temporarily protect the political and economic elite from the forces, from these destructive forces uh, implied in a free market uh, system. And whether uh, the difference between Russian and US imperialism, I mean, of course, they are to an extent different. Any of them, I mean, there are different level of analysis and the, on the very general level, when we call both of these countries as imperialist countries, so we kind of come to agreement that there are uh, something which is common in them and uh, yeah. But of course, if, when you go to the, from this very abstract and general level to, to the ground, you see that the differences are like bigger and bigger and so there are still some similarities. So we think there is also this problem maybe um, that um, we kind of seeing we have seen the western model model of imperialism for yeah for decades and we kind of perceive it as the imperialism and when we are looking on uh, emerging or existing or uh, secondary imperialist uh, original imperialist countries we uh, we and we don't see this exact model of course but it doesn't mean that uh, yeah that uh, us is really the model of imperialism and uh, everything which is um, different or is not imperialism or is like proto-imperialism. I mean, they have definitely the general uh, similarities, but on the level of when we go to the, to the material level, which is you know, always very important and unfortunately often forgotten, like we see, we also see the differences, but which do not um, imply that, yeah, that they are making Russia not imperialist or something, but yeah. I, I know it's not what you were telling, but yeah, that, that's probably my answer here. Okay, thank you. And I think uh, I think uh, Anastasia also wanted to add something. Uh, yeah, there was a question uh, from Oksana that was addressed to Oksana and myself about gender. Um, and uh, and 
well, Oksana answered it well. Uh, th there was just one thing that uh, strikes me in um, in the rhetoric in the Russia's uh, in Russia's rhetoric is the many parallels to domestic violence and to rape in particular. Uh, and we all know the, or maybe not all of us, but many of us remember that phrase when Putin was saying, "Well, whether you like it or not, you just to suffer, my my dear." <laughs> um, that uh, this this idea that uh, yeah, it's kind of a very um, uh, masculine idea that you know I'm I'm stronger. I'll make you do what I want, uh, and uh, you you just have to obey. You just have to submit uh, uh, to. Um, to me, uh, and uh, it's also um, striking. I think it's an argument that uh, um, feminists can can use about the, the right to resist. Actually, so a lot of the kind of non-militarist uh, rhetoric is that Ukraine shouldn't resist or should surrender. And you say, but would you say the same thing to a victim um, of rape or of domestic um, violence that uh, that she should uh, uh, surrender? That she should, doesn't have. Um, Right to resist. So I think this uh, uh, this could be. Uh, I mean, uh, this is something that uh, could be uh, explored further. This uh, these this rhetoric, and also that uh, it's a, a domestic issue. They will they will negotiate somehow. Uh, so kind of failing to engage with it, just saying, oh, but yeah, these are brotherly people. You know, this is the same people after all. They're all Slavs. You know, it's it's kind of crazy that they're fighting now, but we all hope that they will reconcile and, you know, live happily together. And the most important is to preserve the family. Uh, so let's, let's kind of try to make them negotiate and sit at the table. Uh, so, so I think this, this parallel can be um, an interesting one from kind of a feminist uh, or gender sensitive uh, uh, point of view. And for the, just add a little bit about uh, the kind of the, uh, restructuring of Ukraine. Um, we and Spilne are actually arguing for the cancellation of uh, foreign debt, and that was one of the things that I just mentioned. And uh, as the question was raised, I remembered how on Ukrainska Pravda, which is one uh, like uh, one of the big uh, media outlets uh, in Ukraine, there was an argument why Ukraine should not demand uh, cancellation of its debt and why Ukraine should not uh, declare default. Uh, and the kind of the argument is that Ukraine has to persuade others that we are a trustworthy business partner and uh, that even in the situation of war we can be trusted we will be we will keep on paying out our debt following all the rules just to kind of to persuade others that you know we are serious uh, business players and that there is something that's uh, outside of our control of course the war but we're doing our best even in those circumstances uh, so yeah, that's an example that, of course, the risks are, are very high. Uh, and uh, I think there's a lot of work for us to, to try to resist those negative uh, uh, tendencies and, and try to kind of insist on a more um, democratic transformation. Uh, on the other hand, I think uh, on, on the kind of from below the popular uh, kind of demand, um, I think it may be in some cases easier to persuade the people um, on kind of the benefits of a kind of a more just socialist uh, transformation. Um, because of just of, of the immense damage, uh, economic damage that was done uh, to, to, to our um, society um, and, and to the economy. Uh, so uh, pe many people are actually relying on social benefits. So it's not uh, no longer just a question of some uh, vulnerable categories uh, whom we don't even know who they are and we don't want our taxes to be spent on those uh, parasites who don't want to work or lazy and so on. Uh, there's actually an understanding that uh, you know millions of people are vulnerable, yeah, and that it's something that touches so many people that uh, it's a question of universal um, rights and social provisions. Um, so, so there there is also room for <laughs> for persuading, trying to persuade on the need of kind of a more um, just uh, socialist transition. Yeah, but it's not it's not going to be easy. Yeah, so from my side, uh, if it's fine, uh, just to add uh, several points uh, to those uh, questions, thanks so much. I think apart from what was already said uh, with regards to this uh, so-called anti-gender approach, um, let's not forget that uh, this kind of uh, is unavoidable part of any uh, sort of fascist ideology which uh, Russia shares with uh, their counterparts in many, many countries throughout Europe and uh, elsewhere. And it's also um, uh, this kind of uh, 
approach uh, was also behind the crackdown, not only on gender issues, but also on the LGBTQ community in Russia. Uh, and it's basically very much in line with the other type of um, uh, fascist approaches that are applicable to other realms uh, in the society. So basically when any type of otherness becomes a taboo, be it uh, with regards to these uh, sexual issues or historical ones or ideological ones or political ones. So you basically are, uh, we, we, you've been experiencing the kind of um, one strict line that has been built up in order to, uh, to refer and to uh, mirror uh, only the uh, Kremlin's discourse, which is again, kind of, uh, distorted image of the uh, Soviet Union sort of style of uh, one one party and one policy approach, which I think is also somehow it's also refers to the third question about imperialism and comparison between different imperialisms. I think uh, those um, both mentioned are, uh, are maybe as Oksana suggested, there are perhaps many similarities, but uh, on a very ideological kind of uh, superstructural level, I would say, they are totally different just because uh, the Russian one is made uh, in um, uh, kind of um, in accordance to the uh, this general approach of uh, uh, perverse imitation of West of the West that it has been constantly like also history wise because unlike the American one it takes a lot from the historical Russian imperialism I mean from the 18th to the beginning of the 20th century one, right? But at the same time, it's very much mixed with the Stalin's rule uh, kind of practices, as well as with Brezhnev uh, type of uh, political approaches. So it's not so much pure, it's rather really a secondary one because it tries to somehow imitate the uh, being a weak in comparison to the West and totally being aware of this. It tries to overcome this weakness, as well as with regards to anti-gender approach, uh, overcome, overcoming the weakness through imitating the strong, but in a very perverse, uh, perverse manner. And uh, I think it's also interestingly enough to add to this uh, restructuring of the Ukrainian state uh, uh, question, because uh, uh, sociologically speaking, I totally agree with what was said. Um, but also, I think it's very interesting to, to add to this, uh, this really very unique feature of the Ukrainian context in which you basically have a kind of a gap, usually, I mean, in so-called normal times, you usually have a gap between the state and the society as such. And the state operates, uh, the, the basically, the, 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 the state's modus operandi is like what you, Adrian, uh, described. But at the same time, in the moment of, uh, in, the, in the periods of uh, the uh, kind of uh, martial law or, or like uh, emergency times, yeah. we see very interesting overlapping right. of this usual uh, state operations with, uh, with the society, societal one, which basically like during the revolutionary times so or during now, during the war, which are somehow uniquely they overlap, but in a totally inconsistent manner, because on the one hand, you have these usual neoliberal policies of the state, but at the same time, they overlap with the societal practices, which basically stricto sensu are kind of a best example of, uh, of the communist tradition. Like this unbelievable level of solidarity, the way how people collaborate, the, the way that they are actually uh, working together um, without being agreed uh, on, on that or another matter beforehand. So uh, that's what we experienced on Maidan, on the square directly. And now during the war time, it's somehow the whole country became like one whole Maidan square, just helping the state. Because it's also very important to, to take into account that without this societal support, the state wouldn't be able even to survive in a, in a very practical sense. So of course, uh, it's a big question whether it can um, can be sustained for a long run or for a mid run at least. I think it's a big question, but at the same time, for these uh, emergency moments, uh, it it works somehow pretty well. I have to say. <laughs>
Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm very sorry. We're out of time, unfortunately. I can see that there are many uh, other questions coming and yeah, I'm sorry, we have to wrap up already, but we will have another, I mean, not, I'm not, <laughs> the Heaven's Right Center, we will have an, uh, uh, have another uh, uh, event like this with the Russian scholars on the left about the same, uh, about the same um, um, problems that we're facing now. So uh, I invite you all, it's, it's gonna happen uh, in about a month uh and uh the the ad will be out there soon um yeah and thanks again for wonderful um, talks uh um, i uh, thanks to our panelists um and i hope to uh, to get in touch with you sometime soon maybe in the next panel thank you everyone. thank you so much thank you so much bye 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 Thank you.